All right, guys, here we go. So this is the problem, if you will, with what we're about to do. If it weren't for fall break, I think you would be more successful, perhaps, um, with what we're about to do. Because, guys, what we're going to do is we're actually going to wrap up a conversation that you don't even know we began all the way back on the 11th of this month. So guys, what I wanna do is I wanna help you sort of wrap back to that so that as we dig into this, you'll at least have a little bit of context for where we're starting. For those of you that printed the notes, you may have noticed that the very first, well not the title, but the second slide of the notes actually comes back to uh, decay reactions, which is actually where we need to talk. But guys, the problem is, is that it was so long ago that I think that's not going to be enough. So instead, Allow me to offer you this. So guys, and again, test Thursday, right? So this is not me just helping you get caught up with the thinking. This is also the stuff that you're gonna see on the test. So guys, you understand that that, that first day when we talked about uh, nuclear changes, we talked about fission, we talked about fusion, we talked about decay. And guys, when we talked about decay, we talked about alpha, beta, and gamma decay. So let's talk about some of the things that you need to know for the test, you ready? So alpha, beta, gamma decay, there's three types, right? And feel free to write any of this down you want as you're thinking, gosh, I need to know this for the test. If you've got questions, please ask, but let's re-engage. So guys, alpha, beta, gamma decay, how many of those decay types are actually particles? Alpha and beta are both particles. What about gamma? simply energy, right? It's high energy, it's the most penetrating, but it is simply energy. So guys, alpha and beta decay are our particle decays. Now let's talk. Alpha decay, what is that particle? A helium nucleus. Beta decay, what is that particle? An electron. So guys, alpha decay is a helium nucleus, two protons and two neutrons. Beta decay is an electron that comes out of the nucleus when a neutron becomes a proton. So guys, from there then, we started doing things like this on number seven, and we started writing these decay equations. And this is where we're going to jump into the new material. So guys, do you need to be able to do these decay equations for gamma radiation? No, why not? Gamma radiation doesn't change the nucleus of the atom. It is simply a release of energy. So you've only got to be able to do these for alpha decay and beta decay. So now let's remind ourselves. So guys, when we talk about alpha decay, that's a helium nucleus. And notice what happens when something goes through alpha decay. The atomic mass goes down by four. The atomic number goes down by two. Questions on that? Go ahead. Correct, so let me grab writing utensils. Um, yeah, so the idea being, uh, do this, do this, do this, do this. So the idea here is that this is the alpha particle. It's a helium nucleus. And when something releases an alpha particle, uh, the atomic mass goes down by four, the atomic number goes down by two, and realize it forms a new element. So bismuth becomes thallium because element 83 becomes element 81. You guys good on alpha decay? So then guys, let's look at beta decay. So beta particles are high speed electrons coming out of the nucleus when a neutron becomes a proton. And guys, when that happens, the atomic number stays the same because protons and neutrons have the same mass. And then the atomic number goes up by one. And so silicon becomes phosphorus. You guys good? You're okay? You're sure? Okay, so guys, this is obviously not everything that you need to know. I would strongly encourage you to print the uh, study guide and make sure that you have a handle on that material. But guys, this is certainly a good start. So questions about alpha, beta, or gamma decay right now that you'd like to clarify? Yeah. No, so the letter C, you mean? So letter C, the, the difference was here they gave you, how was it different? 
Maybe, oh, I know what it was. They gave you this, and you had to identify the decay type. So atomic number stays, the, or mass stays the same. Atomic number goes up by one. That's beta. So those are the only two you've got to keep track of, is alpha, where the mass goes down by four, the number down by two, or beta, where the mass stays the same and the atomic number goes up by one. Is that OK? Go ahead. Yes. That, and so the answer is both. When we talk about these decays, you need to know what the particle is and what happens to the thing that's decaying. Okay. Just keep going. Yeah, good. And that's actually what we're going to talk about today. So guys, are we, are we OK to transition? Because that's what we're going to talk about right now, is how long does this take? Because you mentioned this idea that it takes a long time. Well, it takes a long time for some of the atoms, but for other of the atoms, it happens instantaneously. So guys, that's the segue today. What we're going to talk about today is how long does this process take? So let me clean this up, let me click here, let me throw this out, let me grab this. And guys, this is where we're going to pick up today. The date today is the 24th. The topic for your notes today is half-life. And guys, let me explain to you the way today is going to unravel. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to set the stage for you. Why do we need to talk about half-life? And uh, you're going to see that it's going to be really redundant given that we just looked at the homework. Then after that, you're going to have this long page of notes. And you're going to write down everything that you need to know about half-life. Then, guys, we're going to muck around with half-life conceptually. Um, and then we're going to muck around with half-life mathematically. And then you'll probably get most of your homework done today. You guys ready to go? So guys, don't write this down, but this is the transitional thought. So when we talked on the 11th, we talked about this idea that elements decay radioactively. That could be alpha decay, it could be beta decay. You don't need to worry about gamma decay because it doesn't change the nucleus. Well guys, these are the questions that we're going to answer today. What happens to the atoms that are decaying? And guys, you already know the answer. What happens to the atoms that are decaying? They turn into something else, right? If it's alpha decay, they turn into an element two atomic numbers lower. If it's beta decay, they turn into an element one atomic number higher. So what happens to the atoms when they decay? They turn into other elements. But then the follow-up question is, as you were saying, how long does this take? How long does it take for atoms to go through alpha or beta decay. And so guys, we then talk about things like this. And again, this is redundant because this is exactly the homework we looked at. But let's make sure we're clear. So guys, we've got uranium-235 and we've got this dude. Is this an alpha or a beta decay? Alpha decay. How do you know? That's an alpha particle. So guys, what is our product going to be? Well, what's going to happen to the atomic number? down by 2, what's going to happen to the atomic mass? Down by 4, so this will be 234 over 90. But guys, that is no longer uranium, it's thorium. So guys, this answers question number one. What happens to these elements when they decay? They turn into other elements. Is that OK? So now, guys, question number two. How long does this take? And that's what we're going to talk about next. You ready to start writing a bunch of stuff down? OK, so guys, it goes like this. What we're going to talk about now is half-life. And you want to write these things down word for word. So guys, what is half-life? Well, half-life is a measure of radioactivity. And guys, these are all the notes, the typical notes that you're going to take today. It's going to feel like a lot. Just get them in there, and then we'll talk about this conceptually, and you'll get it. So guys, half-life is a measure of radioactivity. So, the story goes like this. Atoms in radioactive materials just spontaneously break apart. They decay. So picture that chunk of uranium that we had in class with the Geiger counter. I didn't want to grab it because I don't want uranium dust all over. It's not worth it. 
Because we understand this, that atoms in radioactive materials just spontaneously break apart. We call that decay. Go ahead. Nope. Now guys, here's the problem. It is impossible to tell. We can't tell when an individual atom will decay. There is no way to predict when that will happen. Because it's spontaneous, there's no way to predict. So what do we do? Am I going too fast? You're okay? So guys, what do we do? Well, instead we talk about fractions. Because we can tell when a fraction of the atoms will decay. Guess what fraction? That's where the name comes from. Guys, the fraction that we're going to look at is a half. So how long does it take for half of these things to decay? So guys, the big idea then becomes this. The amount of time that it takes for half the atoms in a piece of radioactive material to break apart is what we call half-life. So again, the thinking is this. We can't figure out when an individual atom will decay. So instead, we talk about fractions. And the fraction we talk about is a half. And in one half life, that is the amount of time that it takes for half of the atoms to decay and turn into something else. You still caught up? You okay? Just two more lines and you're done. Actually, three. Three more lines and you're done taking notes. And then we're just going to play with this conceptually. You okay? Go ahead. <coughs> no, so that, that's, a, that's a chemical process. So if you put paper in fire, we know that it's all going to burn. Eventually, the fire is going to go out because the paper is gone. Um, that's not this. Um, they're, they're related, and my AP students hate the relationships because we have to describe them. But what you're talking about is something that goes to completion. And you're going to find out in a minute this doesn't. So it's, it's not, it, it, right now, don't try to tie the two together. It's going to get dangerous. So guys, the last things you need to understand is this, and I think you do. So when something goes through decay, where do the atoms go after they decay? Well, they don't just go away. After each half-life, half of the original sample remains. But guys, just to reinforce this, what happens to the other half of the sample? Well, it doesn't disappear. It becomes another element. And when you're done writing that down, you're done taking notes, we're going to fiddle with this. 11 different ways. Make sure you understand the concept. Then we're going to deal with it mathematically, and that'll be our day. Well, and then you'll get your homework done, I think, maybe. So guys, what we're going to do is we're going to come at this concept from three different directions. First, I'm going to show you through a demonstration what this is all about. Then we're going to turn to a video to let you understand what this is all about. Then we're going to turn to graphical representations to show you what this is all about. And once you understand it conceptually, then we'll look at it mathematically. You ready to do the conceptual stuff? Are we ready? OK. So guys, you're done taking notes for quite a while. Just hang tight and think through this with me. You can sort of shake out your hands. You're done. OK. So guys, this is how to understand half-life. You ready? Here's what we're going to do. Right here, on, you know what? Let's do it. I wasn't planning on getting the uranium, but we're going to grab some uranium. So here we go. I may die, but it's worth it because it's for science. All right, so guys, here we go. So you understand this isn't pure uranium, right? 
Okay, this is uranium ore. But for this purpose, let's pretend that this is pure uranium. So sitting right here, we're going to pretend that is a chunk of pure uranium, all uranium the whole way through. Now what we're going to do is this. We are going to say that this wall right here is zero uranium. All the uranium is decayed and turned into other elements. You get the idea? Okay. Now guys, let, and this isn't true, but let's say this. Let's say the half-life of uranium is 10 years. Let's use an easy number. Let's say it's 10 years. So let's do this. So this is a timeline. So right here, pure uranium. Over there, zero uranium. And a half-life is 10 years. Ready? So here we go. Time zero. And we are going to let this uranium decay for 10 years. We are now 10 years into the future. How much of this is still uranium? Half of it. So guys, a half of this is still uranium. Th this part of it is still uranium. Now what about the other half of it? Is it gone? No, what did it turn into? Other elements through the decay process like we saw on the board where it became thallium. So guys, half of this is still uranium and the other half is now other elements. You get the idea? Here's the question. What's going to happen in another 10 years? So if we lost half of this in one half-life, then certainly 10 years from now, we're going to lose the other half and it's all gone, right? No, that is not what happens. So if that's not what happens, what does happen? Well, the idea is this, guys. Now we're back to pure uranium, right? 10 years later, how much of this is still uranium? Half. Now what's going to happen in 10 years? We are going to lose half of the half. So in 10 more years, we're going to move half of the half. And now how much of this is still uranium? A fourth. And what about the other three fourths? Other elements. And then what about 10 years later? 10 years later, I'm right here. How much of this is still uranium? An eighth and a sixteenth and a 32nd, and a 64th, and a 128th, and a 256th, and a 1024th, and will I ever hit the wall? No. What do we call that mathematically? It's an asymptote. You will never get to the wall. Guys, because we can always take half of an ever-decreasing half, and you will never completely run out. Because every half-life, in this case 10 years, every 10 years, we're simply dividing it in half, in half, in half, in half, and you'll never get there. Does that make sense? But you don't like it, do you? It makes sense conceptually, but guys, really, we'll never get to the wall? Won't we ever get to the point where we've just got one atom left? And when that one atom turns into something else, isn't it all gone? Because the answer makes sense logically, right? The question makes sense logically, but the answer is no. The reason is because even in this chunk of uranium, there's an uncountable number of uranium atoms. There's trillions upon trillions, and the universe isn't old enough for us to get to the point where there's literally one atom left. So practically, we will never run out because we don't have enough time for it all to go away. Do you get the idea? So guys, that's the fundamentals of half-life. Questions or things you want to talk about? Go ahead. Only the radioactive ones. And understand, there are radioactive elements in that table, specifically carbon-14. So someday, thousands of years from now, Orem High School could become an archaeological site. It, <laughs> the old one actually was. Um, and, uh, and, so <laughs> when, and somebody could come along and they could dig up your table. And they could go, how long ago did they teach chemistry in this room? And they can actually take the carbon atoms out of the wood that makes up this table. And by finding out how much carbon-14 is in there, they can figure out how old the table is. That's, it's called radio. It's called carbon 14 radioactive dating it's how they date things from antiquity like the Dead Sea Scrolls and things like that go ahead right mm-hmm 
Absolutely, yeah, because grapes that become wine are organic, they contain carbon. Anything that was ever alive, whether it's a grape or a table or a person, bones, um, they can figure out how old they are by looking at how much radioactive carbon-14 is still in them. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. You guys okay with the idea of half-life? Go ahead, John. No, and that's a good question. And well, we should be careful. Will, let me, let me twist your question. So John's question was, could something ever be so old that we can't carbon date it? And in theory, no, because we understand the carbon-14 will never completely go away, but it may exceed our abilities to detect it. You know what I'm saying? So if we had the perfect detector, the answer would be no. But because of the limitations of our lab equipment, the answer could be yes. But I know they can go back quite a ways. So you guys good on the idea of, of half-life? OK, so guys, let me ask you if you, let, let's try this. Do you remember in this class, not in your math class, because I understand some of you are doing half-life in math right now too. Guys, in this class, when did you first encounter the concept of half-life? Do you remember? Let me show you. Because, guys, now, now that you understand the idea of half-life, I'm going to propose to you that this video is going to be much more meaningful. Bill. Yay. Let's go back. So, guys, this is where you first encountered the concept of half-life. You may remember it was... This dude, the guy that kept calling people a species. Remember him? Yeah, he's, he's sort of an interesting guy. But guys, this is where we first encountered the idea of half-life. Some of you may want to rewrite your papers after watching this video, now that you understand what half-life means. So guys, I've actually edited this video down to like a three-minute snippet Check this out again now that you understand half-life. Here it comes. Plutonium is the most dangerous thing that human beings have ever made. It will probably be our demise. A millionth of an ounce the size of a speck of dust if inhaled will cause lung cancer. A few pounds the size of a grapefruit that you can hold in your hand will bring down a city if used in a nuclear weapon. And it has a 24,000 year half-life. So guys, remember that number, 24,000 year half-life. Just tuck it away in your brain. We measure radioactivity in what's called half-lives. You see, the atoms in radioactive material spontaneously just break apart or decay. Now, we can't tell when an individual atom will decay, but we can tell when a fraction of them will. Did any of you make the connection? Go ahead, Zach. No. These are your notes. Yeah, listen to Bill. All the notes that you just took is actually a transcript of Bill's words. What's called half-lives. You see, the atoms in radioactive material spontaneously just break apart or decay. Now, we can't tell when an individual atom will decay, but we can tell when a fraction of them will. So a half-life is the amount of time it takes for half the atoms in a piece of radioactive material to break apart. You realize Bill is the source of all knowledge. Okay. Now, plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. So let's say this red water is the plutonium... Okay, now guys, watch close. This is disturbing. ...in a spent nuclear fuel rod fresh from the reactor. Well, after one half-life, 24,000 years, diluting this water by half, it looks like this. After two half-lives, 48,000 years, it would look like this. After 10 half-lives, 240,000 years, the water starts to look pretty clear. Now, plutonium is notorious. It's especially radioactive. It's 20 million times more radioactive than uranium dug from a mine. You see, we're not talking about potato salad left out in the sun. We're talking about plutonium. Now, the legal requirement for storing this material is only 10,000 years. That would be over here someplace. That's not even half of a half-life. You get it? So, guys, let's talk. Let me go back here. Okay, so taking what you now understand, watch your eyes, I'm gonna turn on the lights. Taking what you now understand about half-lives, let's talk about what this means. So guys, first of all this, what in this little demonstration, for lack of a better term, what in this demonstration represents the plutonium? 
the red food coloring, the red color. So guys, right here, this is 100% plutonium, okay? So the red food coloring represents the plutonium. Now guys, what do these cinder blocks represent? Half-lives. And remember, the half-life for plutonium is 24,000 years. Now let's pull the ideas together. So guys, the thought then is this. This jump right here represents 24,000 years. And in 24,000 years, what happened to half of this plutonium? It became something else. So how much of the plutonium is left? Half. You guys said you understood half-lives. Do you understand that? So in one half-life, half of the plutonium became something else, and the other half of the plutonium is still there. It's still plutonium. So guys, what in this little section represents that half of the plutonium still remains? Where is that half represented? The decrease in the redness of the water. In order to do this, what he did is he actually took this and he watered it down by half. So this is half as red as that, showing you that it's half as concentrated because half the plutonium went away. You get the idea? Okay, so now guys, let's keep going. This is another half-life. How much of the plutonium remains in there after two half-lives? A fourth. It's a half of a half. That's a fourth. So this is a fourth is red. How about here? An eighth, a sixteenth, a thirty-second, a sixty-fourth, a one-twenty-eighth, a two-fifty-sixth. So guys, over here, we only have one two-fifty-sixth of the plutonium remaining. Now guys, let me ask you a question. If this red stuff were poison, would you drink this? No. Would you drink this? Would you drink this? Would you drink that? You can still see the red tint, can't you? Would you drink that? Maybe. But guys, that's a quarter of a million years from now. That's 240,000 years from now. And just then does this stuff start to look like something you'd be willing to drink. Now guys, let's tie this back to the big problem. How long does our government say we've got to be able to store this material? 10,000 years. Yeah, guys, we only have to be able to store this material for 10,000 years. That isn't even a half of a half-life. And that's the legal government requirement. Guys, where did that number come from? Do you remember? How did they come up with 10,000 years? Do you guys not know? Do you guys not remember? John, we'll talk after class. Do you guys not remember? Because the answer is this. The government showed that these containers began to break apart at 11,000 years. Is this starting to sound familiar? 11,000 years, the containers start to fail. So they said, let's just make the legal limit 10,000 years so that our containers can be legal. That's disturbing, y'all. Because they're saying the only place where this 10,000 year limit came from was they set their own guidelines so that they could say our containers are good. But guys, if you look at the science, 10,000 years is a joke. That's not even a half of a half-life. You may want to consider this as you're thinking about writing your papers, depending on what you wrote. Because guys, this is sobering if you understand what's going on. So do you get the idea? So we've looked at half-life two different ways. We've looked at it with our little thing on the floor. We've looked at it relative to what Bill was telling us, and I think we now understand this a little bit better. Guys, questions up till this point about half-life? Go ahead. Yes, and that's actually, I'm going to table that question for a second, but right, so if, so if plutonium, this is crazy, right? If plutonium goes through alpha decay, check this out. So if plutonium goes through alpha decay, what does it turn into? Uranium. 
uranium. That's still radioactive. So what happens to the uranium? Well, it gives off alpha particles and it turns into other stuff. And so that's the thing they're not even talking about in this is the stuff that the plutonium turns into is also radioactive and deadly. It's a mess. And actually where we're gonna wrap up the day is talk about where does it actually finally end up? And we'll, we'll finish with that. Are you guys okay with Half-Life here? Okay, so let's try this. We've talked about it in terms of a demonstration. We did it in terms of a video. Now guys, let's look at this graphically. So for example, if, if you're mathematically minded and don't try to draw this, but guys, just allow yourself for a second to check this out. So what are the units on the x-axis? Time. What are the units on the y-axis? Well, guys, the answer is they're not given. But what they actually are is percent of the sample that remains. So this is 100%. This is a half, which is what? 50%. This is 25%. This is 12.5%. So guys, this then is what this decay looks like graphically. After one half-life, we've got a half left. After two half-lives, we've got a fourth. After three half-lives, we've got an eighth. And it just keeps going down. Does it start to connect with some of the things you've talked about mathematically? But guys, let's tie it back then graphically. Because it's hard to see a half and a fourth and an eighth. So tell me what you think about this. Better? These balls now represent atoms. So if we start with 10, how many do we then have after one half-life? Five. After two half-lives, two and a half. After another half-life, one and a fourth. And it just keeps getting smaller. But guys, here's the question that I would ask you. What's wrong with this? What's, what's missing from this depiction of how half-life works? Say it again. Well, absolutely. First of all, we've got to understand that this scales up into trillions of atoms. Because I, I actually considered deleting this slide out of my notes. I pulled this in last night, and I realized I didn't like it. Go ahead. Right, but if we, and I love that, and absolutely. So guys, we understand that we can have fractions of atoms, but if these represent millions, and actually that's what they're saying, that this actually represents millions of atoms, then we understand you can have fractions of millions. What else don't you like about it? I agree with Jane that this should be scaled up into the millions, but maybe it is. I agree as well that we can have fractions of atoms. Anything else you don't like? Go ahead. Exactly. Guys, where's the other stuff? Where's the products? Where are these half million, well, half million atoms? Where did they go? You know the answer. Where did they go? They're still there. They're just something else. And guys, that's why I threw out this slide. I don't like it because it makes it look like you start with 10 million atoms and a half-life later you've got 5 million atoms less and the other 5 million just disappeared. And what about, where, where are all the rest of the atoms? Well guys, they're still there. So then I found this and I like this better. Do you see how they changed it? I like this better. Because guys, the red circles, and there's a hundred of them, the red circles represent the element that we're starting with. And after one half-life, what do we end up with? Half red, half gray. What about after another half-life? How much of this is still red? A fourth, and how much of it's the gray stuff? three-fourths, and now we've got an eighth of the red, and seven-eighths gray. And guys, now we start to see this visualization that we're not actually losing the atoms, they're just turning into something else. Do you get the idea? Okay, so guys, here's where we're at right now. I get the sense that you're understanding half-life. You saw it visually, you saw it through video, now you see it graphically. So guys, are you feeling comfortable with the concept of half-life? 
Okay, so now guys what we need to do is this. If we understand this visually, conceptually, graphically, now we need to describe this mathematically. And guys, you want to grab your calculators and we're going to talk about the math of half-life. And guys, it goes like this. These are the two equations that you need to know. I'm going to allow you a second to write them down, then we'll talk about them, and then we're going to start solving them. Guys, these will be given to you on the test, but you need to know how to solve them. So guys, these two equations represent mathematically everything that we've just talked about conceptually. So guys, the equation on the left says this, n, which as you can see below is the number of half-lives, is equal to the time that something sits around and the time of its half-life. And then the percent of a sample that remains is equal to 2 raised to the n power, which is um, where n is the number of half-lives. So guys, let me let you write these down. Then I want to play with them with you for just a second. And then we're going to use them to solve a couple problems. And then um, you guys will have some time to work on your homework while John and I step next door and see if we can clarify a couple things. You guys good? You OK? Okay, so guys, don't write any of this down, but let's talk just to make sure you're clear. So let's talk plutonium really quickly. Do you remember? What's the half-life of plutonium? 24,000 years. So guys, imagine this. So the half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years. If you have a chunk of plutonium that sits around for 48,000 years, how many half-lives did it go through? Two. What if it sits around for 96 thousand years. Can you do that math? How many half-lives does it go through? Four. So all you've got to do is if you know how long the sample sits around and if you know how long a half-life is, you do the division and it tells you the number of half-lives. Get the idea? Okay. So guys, what about this? What if this sample sits around for a hundred thousand years and a half-life is twenty-four thousand years? How do you figure out how many half-lives? Just do the division, right? But it's not going to be a whole number. Because I won't do that to you on the test or in the homework. Your half-lives will always work out to be whole numbers. You understand practically they don't have to, but the numbers that I give you will always work out to be whole numbers. Good? OK. So now, guys, let's fiddle, out, or fiddle around with this one on the right. So now what we know is this. The percent of a sample that remains is equal to 1 over 2 raised to the number of half-lives. So guys, let's do this. This is number of half-lives, and this is percent that remains. And I'll bet you're going to see this starts to sound familiar. So guys, after one half-life, how much of a sample is left? A half. After two half-lives, how much is left? A fourth. And then an eighth. And then a sixteenth and then a 32nd. Guys, where do these numbers 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32 come from? It's this. If you plug in the number of half-lives in for n, it gives you 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32. So for example, what 2 to the fifth power? Well, 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16, times 2 is 32. Guys, that's where this equation comes from. Understand that this is an exponent and not a multiplier. But if you understand how to do exponents, 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, 16, 32, that's where 1 32nd comes from. Do you get the idea? OK. So guys, we're going to solve a couple problems. And then you're going to have time to work on your homework. If you want to write it down, you can. It says this, 50 grams of plutonium decays for 72,000 years. 
what mass of plutonium remains at the end of this time, remembering that the half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years. You guys ready to go? Okay, so guys, let me just speak to experience here, from experience. You're gonna get into the middle of these questions on the homework and the test and you're gonna get so spun around. This one, frankly, is relatively simple. Um, the reason that I picked the simple one first is because I wanted to give you the opportunity to see the process. Eventually, you're gonna find that these become muddled enough that, frankly, you're gonna get lost in the middle of them. So. How do you avoid the confusion? Guys, write down equations every single time. This isn't me just saying, yes, you need to write down your equations. This is me saying you need to write down these equations because if you don't, you're going to get lost. So guys, when you're solving these problems, discipline yourself to write down the equations. You got them? Okay, so now that you've got the equations written down, how do these keep you from getting confused? Well, guys, the answer is this. All you've got to do is figure out what you're solving for, plug in what you're given, and then let the numbers get you to your goal. So as we read this, it says 50 grams plutonium, 72,000 years. What mass of plutonium remains at the end of this time? And then it gives you the half-life. So guys, what are we solving for? What mass of plutonium remains, right? So we're solving for the mass that remains. So where in these equations is the mass remaining? It isn't. But what's the closest we can get? Percent, percent remaining. Guys, that's our goal. We are going to solve this for percent remaining. What good does that do us? Well, we're going to find out that eventually it's the percentage of 50 grams. So if we know that we started with 50, and if we know the percent remaining, then we can figure out the mass remaining. All right, so now we're ready to get started. So guys, if we know percent remaining, what do we need to know? If we're going to solve for percent remaining, what do we need to know in order to come up with this? We need to know the number of half-lives. What does it say in the problem? How many? It doesn't say. But now if we turn to this equation, we can figure it out because this n is the same as that n. So if we can solve for n right here, we can then figure out the n, take it over there, and then we can solve the problem. So guys, what we need to know is actually t and t one half. So what is t? The amount of time it actually sits around. And how long does it sit around? 72,000 years. Now we need to know t one half. What is that? 24,000 years, the amount of time in a half-life. And guys, again, as I told you, I will always give you numbers that work out to whole numbers. So 72,000 divided by 24,000 is 3. Now guys, what do we do with the 3? Well, this 3 half-lives is that value for n. So what do we do? We go percent remaining is equal to 1 over 2 to the third. And of course, we all know that 2 to the third is 6. And so we have a sixth of our, our original amount remaining. No. Yeah, guys, 2 to the 3rd is not 6. 2 times 3 is 6, but this is not 2 times 3. This is 2 raised to the 3rd power. And guys, if you need to do it with your fingers, go for it. It's 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8. It's an exponent. You're multiplying by factors of 2, so this would be an 8th. So our percent remaining is an 8th. But guys, an 8th of what? Just a second. An eighth of what? 
50 grams. So now all we've got to do is this last calculation that says mass remaining is an eighth of 50 grams. And guys, we are not going to limit significant digits based on these fractions. So we're going to go three significant digits, and that would be 6.25 grams. And guys, again, if you tie this back into what we just talked about, Guys, 50 grams of plutonium is not that much plutonium coming out of a reactor. And 72,000 years later, we've still got more than 6 grams of plutonium left, and a speck of plutonium dust will kill you. That's bad. Alex, go ahead. What was your question? Yeah, and do that calculation. Yep, you got it. You guys good? Questions on the process, the concept, the math. Okay, then guys, try this one. Again, this was pretty straightforward compared to what you're going to see. This is as hard as it gets. This is the other end of the crazy spectrum. So guys, it says 100 grams of molybdenum 91 decays for 60 minutes. At the end of this time period, Six and a half grams of the molybdenum remains. What is, or I'm sorry, six and a fourth grams remains. What is the half life of the isotope? Kind of, yeah. So, guys, I'll give you a second to write it down. Then we're going to talk about how to set this up and solve it. And then we're going to answer Calvin's question. And then we'll wrap up the day. You good? Not quite yet. All right, so what are we always going to do first? <coughs> Write down the equations. So guys, after the test on Thursday, when you find out that you have to do remediation because you got these wrong and these are essentials, um, the first question that you want to ask yourself when you find out you do have to come back for remediation is, did I write down the equations? And if the answer is no, you immediately have identified probably why you've got to come back. Write down the equations. All right, so guys, let's read. Very last sentence. What is the half-life of the isotope? What are we solving for? The half-life of the isotope. Guys, where in these equations is the half-life of the isotope? In the first equation, in the denominator. That's what we're solving for. <clears throat> so guys, if this is what we're solving for, what do we need to know? Well, we've got to know the other parts of this equation. We've got to know n, and we've got to know t. Doesn't that make sense? In order to solve the equation, we need to know the other parts. So guys, let's start to set this up. Do we know n? Does it tell us the number of half-lives? It does not. Do we know T? Do we know the, the time this thing sits around? We do. It sits around for 60 minutes. So guys, we know T. It's 60 minutes. We don't know the half-life, so that's our X. That's what we're solving for. But guys, in order to solve this, what do we need to know? We need to know n, and we don't. So we're going to replace that with a question mark for now. Yeah. 
that's what we're doing next, exactly. And that's why we're writing down the equations. And Alex, I like the way you described this, where you said working it backwards. Because really, given the way we worked the first problem, that's really what we're doing. Last time we started here, now we're starting there and going the other way. And you'll find that these interrelate in all sorts of ways. So guys, do you understand what we're saying? We know that we know time, 60 minutes. We're solving for t1 half, which means we need to know n, but we don't know it. But guys, look what we do know. We know that we started with 100 grams, and we know that we ended up with 6.25 grams. And guys, that is a ratio. That is a percentage. And we can leverage that. And guys, this is the way we're going to do it. We're going to solve for n. But to do that, we need to know the percent remaining. And to do that, we set up this fraction. And guys, you may want to write this down next to your fraction. It is always small number on the top, big number on the bottom. Sorry, big doesn't look so good. But guys, it's always small number on the top, big number on the bottom. And what is that equal to? Well, that's equal to 1 over 2 to the n. Now guys, for those of you that are mathematically minded, you may know that you can solve this equation using base 2 logarithms. But I'm not going to do that to you. How am I going to avoid having you do that? Your numbers will always work out evenly. So, here's how to solve this by avoiding logarithms. And guys, again, this only works because I'm picking nice numbers. Guys, what we're going to do is we are going to simplify this fraction. And in order to simplify the fraction, we are going to divide the numerator and the denominator by the smallest number, the 6.25. So what is 6.25 divided by 6.25? 1. What is 100 divided by 6.25? It's 16. And that is still equal to 1 over 2 to the n. <clears throat> now, guys, this is how you avoid logarithms. What value for n makes this true? You can do it on your fingers. 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16. Aha! We found the number that we can plug in for n to make that equal to 16. 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16. So what is n equal to? 4. So n is 4. So guys, where does this 4 go? Well, this 4, this n, is this number. Ready? I worked really hard on this. Watch close. So guys, this number right here is that number. Uh, oh, I know. I got the question mark to go away and got the 4 to move. I know. Thank you. So guys, now how do we solve this for x? Cross multiply. 4x is equal to 60. Now how do we solve for x? Divide by 4. x is 15 minutes. So guys, the time of a half-life is 15 minutes. Um, yeah, actually it is. It, the reason I'm wondering is because typically when I just make up problems, um, they're usually just made up. I think this one may actually be right. So guys, questions on the math? You're okay? Yeah. Is the half-life. Yep. You guys good? Go ahead. Yeah, just say the half light. Yeah, just X is 15 minutes. Yep. All right. So, guys, one last thing. This is getting back to Calvin's question that we tabled for a second or two. And the question is this. And, guys, this is not on the test, but I think you guys are curious, so I'd like to share this with you. The answer is, the, the question is this. What happens to this uranium eventually? We understand that uranium goes through alpha decay and it turns into thorium and then maybe that thorium goes through alpha decay. But guys, when does this end? When does it all end? And the answer is lead. Every element heavier than lead 
is actually decaying to the point where it becomes lead. When it becomes lead, it is then stable, no longer radioactive, and it stops changing. But guys, it's not that simple. Check this out. This is actually how it goes. So Calvin, here's the answer to your question. Across the bottom is the mass of the element. Across the left-hand side is the atomic number. So guys, element, let me do this so I can write. So it goes, that wasn't much, okay. So it goes like this. So this is element 92 right here with a mass of 238. So this is uranium 238. And guys, uranium 238 goes through that kind of decay. What is that? Alpha decay, and its atomic number goes down by two, and its atomic mass goes down by four. And so this then becomes element number 90, which is thorium, and its mass is 234. It goes through that alpha decay. Well, guys, the question is, how long does that take? Well, number one tells us that the half-life is 4.5 billion years. That's about half the age of the universe. Then, guys, look at what happens next. This thorium does this, and it goes through that kind of decay. What is that? Beta decay. And the atomic mass does not change, but the atomic number goes up by one. And then that happens again, and it goes through another beta decay, and it turns back into uranium. But now the uranium's mass is 234. So how long does that take? Well, the first alpha decay has a half-life of 24 days, or beta decay, and the second beta decay has a half-life of 1.2 minutes. Happens pretty quickly. Then, guys, check this out. Alpha, 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 alpha decay. This thing now goes through five alpha decays, and it goes all the way down to element number 82, which is lead. But guys, this lead is actually lead 214, and it's still radioactive. So then it goes through a beta decay and a beta decay, and it turns into element 84, which is polonium. Then it goes through another alpha decay, turns back into lead. Now its mass is 210. Then it goes beta, beta, turns back into polonium. Then it finally goes through another alpha decay when it turns into lead 206. And now it's stable and no longer radioactive and the game's over. But guys, look at the half-lives for some of these things. Some of them are on the order of milliseconds. Some of them are on the order of billions of years. We've got years, we've got minutes. But guys, this is the end game. This is eventually what that uranium does. So here's the question then. What's inside this chunk of uranium? All of these things. Because, guys, some of these atoms did this immediately, and they've already turned into lead 206 and they're done. There are some of them that are stuck here, and there are some of them that are on every step of the process. And so, guys, trapped inside this chunk of uranium are actually atoms at every point along this process. You get the idea? You see why, you see why, I, sort why I sort of waited on your question, Calvin? Calvin? But you, but you, you can do this for, for all radioactive, radioactive elements and figure, and figure out their out their eventual, eventual life, life will, will, will look like. Just a second, just a second, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, it well, would have more than more a ton of, ton of years. years. Because, because realize, realize that in that order, order for half, half of the original uranium, uranium sample, sample to turn in, in, in element, element 90, 90, that's going to take 4.5 billion, billion years. years. So, so, again, the universe, the universe is like 9 billion, billion years. Billion years. So, so half, half the age of the universe, the universe half of this to go away, um, um, it would take, take a lot of years. But, but and again, remember, not all of them will ever get there. Ever. Ever. But we're, we're all headed all that direction. direction. Just a second, Just a Jessica. Second. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Right, but remember, half-life is how long it takes half
half of it to go through the process. Some of it's happening right now. So, well, but remember the idea, and this is the concept of half-life, it takes a long time for half of them to get there, but at any given moment, some of those atoms are doing it at any instant. It's happening, you know, relatively slowly. But the problem is, is 4.5 billion years sounds like a really long time until you realize that there are actually septillions of atoms inside that sample. And then all of a sudden you figure out, even though it's a long time, there are thousands, if not millions of atoms going through this process at any given moment. It's the, the problem is not the time scale, it's the scale of how many atoms are in there. And there are so many that at any given moment, there are atoms even going through that first step. Go ahead, Jessica, just a second, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. And so, but at each one of these steps, helium is ejected, right? Yeah. And it turns out that this helium is just ejected out into the atmosphere. And so, like when you fill up a helium balloon, a not insignificant portion of the helium that's inside that balloon originally came from the radioactive decay of things like uranium. Yeah, I mean, it's literally a helium atom, and we can capture it and put it inside balloons. No, you get helium as well, a lot of helium. Yeah. That's heavier than, that's heavier than lead. So like if you took, for example, gold, element number 79, it's not doing this because it's lighter than lead, but everything heavier than lead, yes. So like uranium is heavier than lead, so it's turning back towards the lead. Yes. It depends. Some, so uranium, remember uranium, well, let's do that differently. Lead, if you remember from the video, um, remember when they discovered element 114? And they said that element 114 was going to be doubly magic because of the structure of its nucleus, and we thought it would be really stable. And lead is a group mate of that. So lead is also a doubly magic element that is hyper stable. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Correct. Yes, 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 exactly. Realize that with the noble gases, it's a stability based upon electron structure. With uh, things like lead, it's the stability of a nuclear structure, but they're all just headed towards stability. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly it. Go ahead, Cody. Because it's the easiest. Um, you'll find out, the, the, the answer to the question, why does anything happen, is because it's easiest. Our universe always tends towards paths that are the easiest. And this is the lowest energy way for these elements to become stable. Jane, about, I still see it. Go ahead. What about elements lower than lead that are radioactive? Yeah, so there are other stopping points. I think the next one might be tin. Um, but I'm not exactly sure. You could Google it and look, and I would, but there are other stopping points, for lack of a better term, where these things will hang up and get stable. I just don't know what the next one is, but they're all headed towards those points of stability. My suspicion is that it's not one stopping point like lead. There are multiple stopping points below lead, but I'm not sure. Yeah, Jane, go ahead. Oh, you guys good? Crazy, right? So guys, grab your homework and uh, let's talk. You've got your homework packets in front of you. Um, let me do this and let me do this.